I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to this podcast that will be reviewing the components of the new EAS exam, otherwise known as Educating All Students. As you are all aware, this exam is critical for certification for those students who are looking to be initially certified. It is one of the new requirements that New York State has put in place. And so I will take some time to go through some components of the exam and give you some ideas and tips that you can use at your institution for improving the outcomes um, of candidates who take that exam and really just preparing them adequately for it. So our agenda will will include these items here. The first part of our time today will be providing you with an overview of diversity education. Um, this is critical that you are you yourself as faculty understand what diversity education entails so that you may be able to turnkey that information to your candidates and provide them with some experiences that keeps them knowledgeable. So while the time of sharing various components of the exam and, and different key topics, you'll see some discussion points. And what I have done is I've placed those questions specifically there that you can go back and use um, in your conversations with your candidates, um, any type of workshop that you may do with them. Those are points that you can include, so feel free to take those and use them. I will also provide you with an overview of some key topics. The first topic is on race and culture. I'm going to spend some time discussing the Supreme Court landmark case of Brown versus Board of Education and some other historical events. And I'll talk a little bit about educational equity and things in that domain. The other overview, a large topic that will be overviewed will be in the area of English language learners. There will be some times of us kind of um, somewhat interacting with facts and myths, give you some time to think about some things and I'll come back with an answer. We'll talk about some schooling experiences and some language distinctions that are important for that population of students. And finally, the overview of the topics in special education. We'll talk a little bit about then and now and IDEA and how that has changed what we do in education um, presently. I will also spend some time going over the components of the exam and then summarize some things for you. Before we get started with going through each of these areas, I want to just take a moment to just say that this presentation or this podcast rather gives you an opportunity to just begin to think about what you already have in place, what you might add to strengthen your your program and your courses and so forth. And what I'm sharing with you is kind of uh, a reflection of what we have done here at SAGE to really prepare our candidates. And thus far in the graduate school, um, so many of the students who take the exam are, are being very successful with their with the pass rate for the EAS exam. And so that's important for us and we're excited about that. And so that's giving us this, this indication that what we're doing is working. Uh, we're always improving and of course you know that's what we do here in education, always look for ways to improve. But what we have put together thus far is working. And so we're taking this opportunity to share some of those insights with you. When we discuss diversity education, we're looking at some key areas. The first area that's critically important is understanding that we are discussing diversity consciousness. In order for an individual to move forward, to make good decisions, to be prepared for challenging situations, they must be conscious. And when we understand consciousness, we understand that to mean awake, uh, aware. Um, alert. So any of those words are synonymous with consciousness. And so in order for someone to be conscious, they have to be exposed. And so one of the ways to expose our candidates and just faculty and even P12 teachers is through some mentoring, some diversity training, study groups, different activities, um, traveling workshops, things that just sort of just broaden one's horizon are going to be critical 
for raising the consciousness. So in that domain of consciousness, you have skills as well. There are some things that are distinctive. How do you know that you are utilizing those skills? Well, then you'll, you'll feel comfortable in certain areas and in places where you may not have before. And you'll, you'll have a sense of efficacy of how to address some challenging situations that maybe you did, weren't comfortable with previously. So that skill level is very critical. And so in that consciousness domain, once again, we're looking at um, awareness and also skills. And there's a variety of ways in which that can be attained. This particular presentation right now is one of the ways in which one can raise their awareness and even develop some skills. Um, we also want to keep in mind that skills do require practice and these types of courses are not designed to just be um, one-way communication, but also but opportunities for students to practice those skills in real-life situations and to be mindful of how they're even seeing a lot of these topics unfold. So in the domain of diversity education, for the purpose of our discussion today, we'll be dealing with some three big areas. One is race and culture. The next is English language learners. And the last is special education. Those are the three broad topics that will be discussed in the domain of diversity education. So here is one of the slides that is going to highlight the discussion points that I am presenting to you as an option for you to use in your work with your candidates. And here, is, here are the questions. Identify one issue related to diversity that the teacher should address in her instructional planning related to this lesson. Describe one strategy the teacher could use to address the issue you identify and then explain why the strategy you described would be effective in facilitating student learning. So these discussion questions, while they can be very generic in form, can be very useful in creating a discussion atmosphere with your candidates. These can be things where students can respond to in writing, or it could be part of a discussion that you have with them in class around a scenario or some other type of instructional planning situation. But we always want to keep in mind that whenever we're talking about these three areas, as I just mentioned, those three big areas, it always comes back to instruction and the interaction with students. So you'll see a few more of these and they're going to connect to the specific domains that we'll be discussing. So let's get started with thinking about race and culture. So if you had to think deeply for yourself, why do you think race plays a role in how people perceive, treat, and respond to one another? Is it possible for race and culture to not be a reality for our daily and professional interactions? If you were to take a moment just to pause and think about that question, these two questions, you're going to have to go back in your mind and find scenarios, situations, circumstances in which you have encountered some realities around race and culture. If perhaps you were not able to grab something out of your mind pretty quickly, that may mean that maybe you were not as aware that those things were in operation or perhaps you didn't have some type of negative experience, or maybe it wasn't even anything that you even considered at all. However, there may have been times when you may have thought about something very specific and you could clearly see that race plays a role in how people are perceived. If you've lived long enough, you've had experiences with different individuals from different backgrounds, even if it seemed a bit homogenous in their uh, physical makeup, people are different. And so when we're talking about race and we're talking about culture, we are going to be talking about this notion of difference and how that plays a critical role in interacting and interfacing with scenarios that may not be as common to us um, as our usual situations, but however, they're critical to begin to think about as an educator. So what is race? Let's start there. The first thing I want to start is start by saying is that race is a social construct. So it really isn't real. And what that means is that this idea of race has been something that's been constructed from a social sociological perspective. And basically, 99% of all genetic material is the same. You know, there's a recent commercial, I, I don't recall what the advertisement is for, but the two people are standing behind a screen and you see the skeleton of their bodies and they're kissing 
behind the screen and when they come out in front of the screen I think you see a Caucasian man and an African American woman I believe um, and so but in any case you see the differences in what society has deemed as race you see them differently on their physical outside but behind that screen you saw a skeleton and there was no distinction between um, the race or the the physiological makeup of um, the the, or even the physical makeup of those individuals and so when we think about race we have to keep that in mind and somehow some way through lots of different interfacing through in our in our country this idea of race has been used to distribute resources um, there's some racial categories that are ahead and some that are behind in resource distribution um, in most cases race has a lot to do with power and privilege and so those that have been deemed as being um, the most prestigious or having more resources owned to them or in their possession they usually hold the power race is not just about black and white and a lot of times we've often thought of it in that way but it is a lot broader than that there are other um, cultural groups or racial groups that are part of this construct that we need to be cognizant of and those individuals also have been subjected to um, discriminatory practices and and uh, unfair distribution of resources and the reality is that no one is left out as in as everyone is identified by this political construction there is a demarcation for everyone in our country everyone has a place everyone has a sort of this marker and you you know when you fill out demographic forms there is a place for each person to kind of mark themselves off and some people have problems with that they don't want to be demarcated by one race exclusively and so there's others that can be selected but however as you can see just from just from what I've said here and from your own experiences race is is socially constructed and that's so important that we want to communicate that to our candidates and even in our own selves as faculty because understanding that reality will help us as we are interacting with some really challenging situations and it helps to debunk some of the things that are going on saying okay if someone is making a judgment call what is what is the indication of that a lot of times they're based on stereotypes and prior experiences that they've heard about not necessarily ones that they themselves have had so it really does provide a lot of opportunity for discussion and interaction what is culture and why does it matter whereas race has to do with a social construct everyone has culture and I posit that culture is it's very similar to this beautiful cake that you see in front of you with these multi-layered and multi-colored um, arrangements and while they are all individual in their design in some form or fashion they work together to create a whole cake and so culture is very similar in that way we are made up of a variety of experiences we geographically linguistically um, socially um, economically there's so many different dynamics that make up who we are how we understand the world how we understand the things around us can be shaped by our spiritual understandings or or lack thereof or our economic experiences or lack thereof it, it, it doesn't really matter how you slice the cake ironically there's going to be some layer of difference and and culture is a part of that and so when we discuss this notion of being culturally aware we recognize that each person brings some uniqueness to the conversation they bring Bring some uniqueness to the environment in which they dwell and their environment is impacted by the culture that they bring and vice versa you put a person from one particular geographic location you take them out of that place and you put them somewhere else long enough they will begin to adapt to the environment in which they find themselves so culture is a critical issue and it does matter if your cultural experiences are very different from mine you may see the world different than I but who's right and when we get into the discussion of who's right and who's wrong that's when we go down the road of power and privilege if you are to tell me that the way that I think about something is wrong and your way is right and you force your way on me because you have more power than I have then that is what we call an ism that can be racism sexism um, ageism any of those isms and so when we think about the connection between 
power and privilege and culture they're very very closely connected and it's important that we are understanding that so that in our communication with our candidates we're not watering down the vitality of that discussion because it is one that is extremely rich extremely meaningful and should be taken very seriously we're going to spend a little time talking about Brown versus the Board of Education, which is a Supreme Court case that was argued and was won in 1954. And this Supreme Court case desegregated the schools. And there was a play, there was times in many locations in the South and, and even in places in the North that schools were segregated. There was the black school, there was the white school. And children that and black children were not allowed to those white schools. They often had very deplorable conditions. Um, they were uh, not necessarily given the same privileges and opportunities to excel and to go maybe to colleges and things of that nature, um, which is also part of the impetus for some of the historical black colleges. But nonetheless, this this landmark case was very critical. And while it took lots of argument for the case to be heard and to be realized, um, it, lot, lots went into that. And one of the things I would like to say about this is this particular topic is one that I use in my work with candidates here at SAGE. We talk extensively about this topic. They do a lot of reading around it. And so I'm just pausing here just to mention it so that it becomes a part of your understanding and of how you are communicating the foundation of race and culture. Um, well, when we, when we talk about some of the other areas like special education and English language learners, there are laws that govern a lot of what happens with those student populations. However, when it comes to issues of race and culture, there are not as many. There are some, we have amendments, we have the you know Fourth Amendment that deals with um, civil rights and things of that nature we have those things that are in place but but I think this landmark Supreme Court case of Brown versus Board of Education was very pivotal um, and and so I think that it's important to take a look at how a decision was made concerning schools and since we're in the business of educating people this is a good thing for us to discuss so we spent a lot of time talking about this and, and one thing, another thing I'd like to say is that this particular case was not just one case, it was a series of five cases actually that came together and most of the people who were having these discussions and issues and wanted to bring up this, these, these concerns were women and there was one man they were kind of part of like a parent consortium or some sort at different locations across um, various parts of our country. And um, there was this one man, this one particular school that was close to Topeka, Kansas, and his name was Brown. And so because there were a whole bunch of women together, they figured, well, we'll just call it Brown because if there's a man's name on it, maybe they'll hear it and take it more seriously. So there you have even an example of how women were viewed. And, and of course, women didn't have a lot of power and didn't have a lot of privileges during those times and there's still a struggle for that in, in many places and many times uh, in our in our reality however that's how Brown came to be so for those of you that didn't know that a little bit of fact and information for you and the major it, the major crust of the case was that the segregation was causing a psychological um, dysfunction uh, and, and disorder with African-American children if you are not aware or have not exposed yourself to the Kenneth um, um, Clark um, research I would encourage you to do that it was a doll study that where some black children were picking out which doll they thought were, was prettier or smarter and things of that nature and often they favor the white doll over the black doll um, because of their experiences and how blacks were viewed and so the argument was that segregation was really creating uh, a psychological issue for children and that was part of the push to desegregate the schools and there's lots and lots of research on this and I'm just giving you just just the surface of it but that's just something that we do bring up and how in many cases the battle between what's who's pretty who's who's not who's you know acceptable who's not still goes on you can look it up on YouTube right now and see many other uh, replications of that study so I just wanted to just make sure that you're aware of that and that you're making your candidates aware of it as well in addition to the Brown versus Board of Education, there was a, a, 
a, a situation in New Orleans where a little girl by the name of Ruby Bridges was one of the first to go into her um, elementary school. She was a first grader and her family was had the opportunity to send their daughter to the white school. And they, of course, they were under the impression that the white school is going to be so much better for their child. So they ushered their little girl to the school and this Norman Rockwell picture really depicts lots of what that young lady had to experience daily. Even she had to be escorted by U.S. Marshals to school. Um, she sat in the classroom alone because the other parents took their children out of school and it was a very challenging and probably pretty scary experience for this little six-year-old if you can imagine your six-year-old if you have one or had one that's that's pretty severe um, pretty harsh and th these were adults that were hurling negative comments at her as she was going into the school and so Norman Rockwell puts this paint it was a very famous painting but it really captures the challenges that this generation has faced as it relates to race there's a movie clip here and when you actually get the I'll have, give you it make sure you have a PDF of this presentation so you can clip on click on that movie clip to get a sort of a sense of um, Ruby Bridges and some of her experiences. This is a Disney movie, so it's very appropriate for children to watch. I've watched it with my children uh, when they were younger, and I've also showed it to groups of students, and we've had discussions. And so if you would choose to do something like that with your candidates to expose them, I certainly think it's a wonderful idea. I'm a firm believer in movie clips. Um, I think this would just give you some overview uh, of what was going on during that time, and it definitely is a great discussion piece. And even comparing and contrasting with how things have changed and how they haven't. Um, one of the things that is part of um, this experience is that, you know, it's, it's amazing that you would think that something like this could not happen and it seems so unreal, but it was certainly a part of our history. Um, there's another clip here that talks about Ruby in her own words and she's she's being interviewed actually uh, with some students and so you have an opportunity to take a look at that and then there's another clip here because I'm really once again into movies and so forth where you uh, it's, it's called we are we are all going against the grain and it really is this whole promotion of um, looking at the the purpose of equality and um, justice for all people. So this would be a wonderful opportunity for you to reflect and to take away something else from this opportunity that you are being exposed to here. When we talk about what it means to have equality, um, there's also some other clips there that kind of speak to that. And you think of equality, you think of sameness, okay? You think of being able to have the right to do something. And every child, should have the right to be educated and I will say that the laws have certainly changed in favor of that reality and of that notion it has taken so much time we have still so much work to do but there has definitely been a progression towards raising awareness about equality and providing equal opportunity for all children to be successful when we get into this notion of the difference between equity versus equality, I want to just go back and mention again that equality denotes sameness. So that means that every child and every student receives the same level of education in some way. It is some type of one size fit all approach. And there's a time when that's appropriate. If everyone is going to need a textbook and they're going to need some resources to provide the 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 foundation for what they're going to do every child should have that and believe it or not there are many schools that still have lacked those types of resources I think in New York State we've done better um, once again there's still more work to do uh, especially as it relates to technology as an example but equality denotes sameness equity on the other hand denotes responsiveness and this is the meaning that every child is afforded learning opportunities that's individualized to their particular learning needs and environmental factors and so e equity is not the same as every person having the same thing I'll give you an example that was real that happened here at the college level so I was teaching a course this semester and it was an online course and there were two students they were in a partnership and they were working on a project together the responsibility for them was to be online um, synchronously with me and to discuss and share out on their project well unbeknownst to them they had other classes and they didn't realize that that was going to conflict 
with this opportunity to be online um, because when they signed up for the course we didn't have a specific day to kind of hold you know to say hold that place so neither one of them were able to be online at the same time so when it came time for them to share out I provided an opportunity for each of them to present separately they now were both responsible for the whole project to share out the whole project as opposed to just their one part however it still was an opportunity for them to both have equal opportunity to share but it everyone didn't do it the same way so I didn't give the same privilege or the same pass if you would or the same avenue to everyone because everyone didn't need it that partnership group they needed it and they took that opportunity and they used it effectively and even as I was talking with the students that were online and they were sharing their projects I mentioned that the fact that these two students were sharing separately separately was an example of educational equity I provided them with what they needed to be successful it worked well it was fine but you know even with that sometimes people have a problem with equity they think well if this student gets to do it why don't I and so I always try to find opportunities to reiterate that there is a difference between equity and equality. Fair is not equal. There are times when you will not get the same thing as someone else. I use simple examples such as glasses. Every child doesn't need to wear glasses. The children that wear them are the children who need it. If I put glasses on everyone, irregardless of their need, that would be pretty ludicrous and it actually would probably hurt them more than hurt them, help them. So this notion of equity versus equality is very critical as you are having discussions with your candidates around this issue of race and culture. So here's a formal definition of educational equity. Focusing on educational equity means that educators are striving to provide equal opportunities and necessary support for the students who need, thus ensuring equal results for all students regardless of race, gender, or socioeconomic status. So ensuring those equal results, looking to push toward those regardless of issues of race and cult or gender or socioeconomics. And those pieces are really important to include because there are times when educators, um, policymakers even, will use race, gender, or socioeconomic status as a indicator for success or an indicator for lack of success and neither n neither of them any none of them actually need to be an indicator of course if I don't have all the resources I may move a little I mean I have all the access to things that someone else may but it is definitely not an indication of my intelligence level nor my success level so this is why educational equity is an important thing to keep in mind as we begin to transition, we're going to start talking a little bit about English language learners. And so I, here are some key questions that you can keep in mind. Identify one specific learning need for the student. Describe one strategy for differentiating instruction related to the lesson to address the need that you identified. And then explain why the strategy you described would be effective in addressing the student learning need. So these key questions are, once again, pretty generic in form, but yet provide an opportunity for you to um, think deeply uh, and invite candidates to think deeply about what is happening in the instructional environment. So here's our little activity on facts and myths. So is this a fact or a myth? Adults are better at learning a second language than our young children. What would you say? Well, in fact, <laughs> that is, well, that is a myth. The fact that children learn second languages quickly and easily has been a misunderstanding and misnomer for some time. Um, in fact, while children may be more motivated to learn a second language because for some other kind of incentive like going outside or being able to be released from some responsibility that they don't want to keep they may be more motivated it's just as difficult for a child to learn a second language as it is for an adult now there is some physiological differences with children and adults when it comes to learning second languages and the argument is that um, children's brains are a bit more flexible 
and that their cortex is more plastic than is true of older learners. This has to do with this whole um, corollary hypothesis of the frozen brain type of thing that's applied to adult learners. Like they kind of, adults get stuck in one area. But nonetheless, um, it really is not true that adults are any better. Um, it still is a process and children go through a very similar process just like their adult counterparts. Okay. Math is an easy for English language learner because numbers are universal. What say you? Well, that's also a myth. Math involves more than just numbers, and it includes vocabulary terms such as numerator, quotient, simplify, for example. Um, furthermore, words like f table and round have meanings in math different from their more common definitions. And so it's also important to remember that the use of measurement systems like the metric system is not universal in all countries, do not necessarily use um, Aramaic numbers. So it is not going to be a simple task for English language learners simply because numbers are involved. Immersion is the best way to learn a second language. What say you? That's also a myth. English language learners who are immersed in classrooms where only English is spoken may find the experience and their learning incomprehensible. So by allowing students to use their native language in the classroom, teachers can also enhance their ability to learn English. So we need to keep that in mind and in some cases just sort of throwing a person in an environment where they have no sense of understanding of the language can be very, very overwhelming. Like if someone just drops me in a Spanish speaking country, I know a few words, but I would have some major difficulty getting around and getting what I needed. However, if I had an English speaking counterpart to assist me, perhaps I would be more equipped to be able to respond appropriately. A student's first language interferes with his or her ability to learn a second language. What say you? Well, that's also a myth. Because a student's first language might support his or her understanding of the second. For example, a student who is first allowed to read a book in his native language can read it or reread it without having to focus on basic comprehension um, and can instead pay attention to other aspects such as vocabulary and sentence structure. This is important and this kind of goes with the same example previously of the immersion idea. So first language can certainly be a support the students who are trying to acquire a second language. It takes between five to seven years to become proficient enough in a second language to succeed in an English only classroom. What say you? That is a fact. Second language learners need at least five years under the best learning conditions to succeed in English only classrooms with minimal or no support. And after only one or two years of learning second, a second language, a student can typically communicate in social settings, but will not have the sufficient knowledge of the language to be successful in an academic environment. This is very common with students who have moved um, to the States or moved here from other countries that have whatever their native language may be, they learn social language first. So they understand some things to interact with their peers, to get things communicated, to be able to access what they need. But to make that transference of the, not only the articulation um, of those ideas, but also to um, communicate their understanding of those academic terms takes a lot more time. And so that's important to realize that sometimes we're working with a student who may seem really proficient in communicating their ideas in English. However, when it comes to some academic ideas, they struggle. And it doesn't mean that they are intellectually um, incapable, but the language is interfering with their ability to be able to communicate effectively. When it comes to some schooling experiences, this is really important to think about and to keep in mind as it relates to English language learners. So past schooling experiences, some, some have no formal education at all. Some students may have inconsistent or sporadic education. And then there's another group that may have regularly attended school with some level of consistent curriculum. So when those students are coming into our um, mainstream classrooms or inclusion classrooms and they are coming into our buildings and so forth and 
and we are working with them, we need to recognize that those types of schooling experiences are critical and they have a grave impact on that student's ability to be successful. That's very important for our candidates to understand, to not make assumptions about certain things, uh, but to remain cognizant of those differences. That's very, very important. When it comes to language distinctions among English language learners, here's some things to keep in mind. There are two sets of distinctive groups. There's your recent immigrants. Those may be students who have some knowledge of English skills, and then they may have little to no knowledge of English at all. Then you have another group that were actually born in the United States. They are simultaneous bilinguals, and they're learning two languages as, at once, at home and at school. And then there's sequential bilinguals, which means they have a strong first language, and learning English as a second language, depending on the language ability of their parents or, who, or whoever their care caregivers are. These are really important to distinguish the differences between the two because the levels of support that are needed for these populations will vary. Of course, the recent Im immigrants who have very little language, very little experience with it, will need more supports, more scaffolding than maybe a group who was born here in the United States and has some level of understanding of the language. But we don't want to assume that because they've been born here and they may be um, simultaneous or even sequential bilinguals that they don't need support because, of course, they all do. It's just going to be important to discern which level of support is necessary. So we're going to move a little bit into this, some brief conversation about students with disabilities. Um, once again, as I mentioned, this is just an overview of some topics that should be delved into very deeply. I'm just giving some surface ideas because many of these ideas will appear on the exam for our candidates. So let's get to talking about students with disabilities. Let's start with some discussion points, and here is the first one. Identify one aspect of the lesson plan that would be difficult for us to for the student. Describe one modification you would make to the lesson plan to address this area of difficulty, and explain why this modification you describe would be effective for the student. So there's a there's a need to identify, to describe, and to explain, and we're looking at levels of difficulty. A, a teacher, a pedagogue, must be very skillful. Pedagogy, as we know, is a science, it's a skill. And so s candidates that are leaving with initial certification or advanced certificates must be very, very skillful in how they are identifying not only the strengths but the difficulties of students and then to consider how they may address those things. Um, in my conversation with P12 teachers, I find that that modification area is a little weak. Many of them are still struggling. They leave teacher education programs, they get master's degrees, but they're still struggling with modifications. They're still struggling with how to provide that tier one level of modification. So not just your tier two when you look at your RTI model, but that tier one, how are you differentiating for the whole class? How are you looking for a variety of modalities to really address that that skill set with students? And so this, as, as in my experience, I see that P12 teachers are struggling with this, that's an indication to me that we need to be producing candidates who are stronger in that area. So these discussion points are very critical. Special education um, prior to 1960s uh, to 1960 was really about students who were segregated. So um, around the time of Brown versus Board of Education where um, students were segregated because of race, they also were segregated because of disabilities. And so those were students that were um, on regular campuses, but if they were there, they were isolated. They were in separate rooms, separate wings, separate sections. They were not with the larger population at all. Um, some were educated in separate schools altogether, not even in the same area as their regular home school. There was definitely a disproportionate number of students who were in poverty and from diverse backgrounds. Um, kind of moving forward in time, there was this notion of mainstreaming, and this addressed only those with mild disabilities. And so while there is still some of that that's present in some of our public schools, this was pretty much the practice all, all the way across. Um, mainstreaming also assumed that the, the students that were coming into the classroom, they were visitors. And they were visitors in the gen ed program and they only came in for certain subjects and they were kind of there to improve their social skills. And I remember when I was a classroom teacher, that was actually very true. 
I had students that came in for maybe just math or reading, but then they went back to their regular special education self-contained classroom for the rest of the day. And they did seem almost out of place. They didn't necessarily feel like they belonged. It took them time to kind of mesh, but the students were even aware that this stu- this other student was coming in just for this one period and then was leaving again. And there were a lot of questions around that, but that was just the practice around that time. Special education in the 1980s sort of moved to more of a regular init- education initiative, which is the RE- the REI. And this was this place of kind of maybe regulating how practices were carried out. Um, by the mid 80s, this idea of inclusion began. That was when that movement sort of emerged where students were not just coming in for just one period, but just were totally engrafted into the regular flow of the day. Um, there was a lot of pushing uh, services that were provided. People would come into the classroom to support the student and even pull out, pull them out if they needed some extra help. Uh, if they were in um, resource room, that was also part of that, that inclusion movement. So there were students that had those extra services. Um, but it was really, it was becoming more inclusive, more, I would say, integrated as opposed to the 1960s and prior to that time. Um, there was still a lot of controversy that that continued then and still does as it regards to full inclusion. There's many schools that don't believe in that. If a student has a really severe disability, they have a hard time with having them be in a um, gen ed classroom a lot of times because the teacher is not skillful enough to be able to provide those services. And that's sort of maybe some of the push for why we have some dual cert uh, programs that are really strong so that candidates are coming out with that knowledge and skill set. Special education now, um, the idea of IDEA, IDEA, excuse me, IDEA of 2004, this amends the Education for All Handicapped Children Act of 1975. And basically, in, um, it takes these amendments of 1983 and 1986 and the Individuals with Disability Education Act of 1992, 92, and 97, 1992 and 97, and put them all together. And basically, now we're moving toward educating students. Uh, all students or more students rather that are non disabled with their non disabled peers. So you will have more and more schools that have built ramps that have elevators that have that they are mandated by law to have those access points for those students that may have those le- those high levels of disability. And some school districts are more equipped to handle students with those challenges than others. But the notion is that schools should be doing it. it is the responsibility of the public school to provide support for students um, there more currently you're going to see more students with um, disabilities that are employed um, just in your local environments and so forth and more students with disabilities that are attending college even in my experience here at SAGE I've had several students that were identified um, identified themselves as, as needing some special education services and I mandated um, to provide those support services for them extended time note-taking whatever their IEP may have indicated in high school or whatever meeting that they've had with the officials here at the college I'm mandated to provide that level of support for them some of the principles of IDEA uh, include due process Um, each person has an opportunity to present their case um, have their situation heard and and respected Um, and that's critical Um, schools must respect the direction and the input of the parents of that child. There is equal protection for them. So there is a lot of um, support for them to be able to get what they need as a result of this legislation. They've been able to have more support than ever before. There's zero reject. Schools cannot send someone away. Um, Public education is required by law to provide these services for children. And even if they are, if they can't provide it there, they have to get those services to come into that building. They are required to be able to do that um, at, under the law. Um, this is the, uh, another idea is free and appropriate public education, um, the least restrictive environment, and lastly, non discriminatory assessment. And so, all of those things sort of encompass just the responsibilities of public education to make sure that they are providing free and appropriate. Um, education for their students with disabilities and that is least restrictive which means that it is in the lowest level of restriction as possible they're getting exactly what they need and sometimes that's a 12 to 1 to 1 sometimes it's a, a gen ed class and they may have a special education sort of a um, team teaching kind of situation um, but whatever the case may be it must be the least restrictive that the least 
type of restriction that will allow them to be able to have access to the education that they need in a meaningful way. And this idea of non-discriminatory assessment, um, it cannot be, students cannot be discriminated based on race or gender or socioeconomic status when it comes to their assessment um, uh, provisions that are provided for them. That's the public school's responsibility. So those three areas have just been very quickly um, assessed. And once again, I will tell you that the way that we have here at SAGE move forward with this is we have this a course that we've designed that addresses all of these issues in a very detailed manner but i just gave you a very brief overview just to kind of wet your palate but also to get you thinking about what you might be doing with your own candidates or improving or strengthening whatever you have in place so here is some of the components that are a part of the educating all students exams and um just going to take a moment to go over those with you so here's the test content it's going to address diverse student populations, English language learners, students with disabilities, teacher responsibilities, and school home relationships. The three big areas that were discussed previously in this presentation intertwine teacher responsibility and school home relationships. So that's why you won't see those two areas distinctively discussed here because they are discussed throughout. Teacher responsibilities are always a part of how students are educated according to Charlotte Danielson that is that fourth domain of teacher responsibility, professional responsibilities rather and that's always a part of what we do and how we do it and keeping that in mind going forward in every situation and of course if you're working in the school you're going to be working with families you're going to be working with parents or grandparents or you know aunts or uncles and to, and, and our candidates need to understand that their interpersonal skills are critical. So it's not just about book knowledge, but it is highly about your ability to be able to communicate effectively and to work with populations of students that may be different from yourselves and families with different backgrounds and different expectations. So that interpersonal relationship piece is very important. Here's just sort of a snapshot of the formatting of the test. So it is a computer-based test and there's 40 items. Um, there are three constructed responses. It is a two hour and 15 minute exam and 15 additional minutes for some computer-based um, test, a tutorial and non-disclosure agreement. Um, the test is by appointment this year round, Monday through Saturday, excluding some holidays. And so when students go onto the main website, they can check the availability of uh, testing dates and sign up. There are The test is provided at a variety of locations in New York State. You can take it at any place in New York State. So if you're downstate and you want to take it down there, you go ahead and do that. Um, the passing score is 520. And that's important. And I've had a student who um, successfully passed the EAS exam. She had taken it a couple of times previously and had not taken our course um, because she was an undergraduate student and she decided to, um, I think she's moving forward in her graduate uh, degree. And so she took the course um, and oh no, she's gonna, she's finishing up her undergrad degree, but she was able to take a graduate course. That's what the situation was. In any case, she took the she took the exam, and she just notified my colleague and I that she passed it. She was very very excited. So of course we're excited for her as well. Um, the the test fee is one hundred and two dollars. There is some release times in terms of when the scores are reported. And there's also some opportunities some, to prepare. There's some resources that are provided to assist students I'm going to talk about briefly. So um, there just there's another sh slide here that just talks about the different areas and the number of items. And so as you can see, there's a pretty much equal distribution between the diverse student population, English language learners, and students with disabilities. Pretty equal in the distribution. And there is a constructed item for each one of those areas. Um, I will tell you that in further investigation of the exam, I'm understanding that scenarios play a huge part of what the candidates are expected to do. They must be able to read a scenario. Here's a situation. There's usually some type of data that has to be analyzed and that has to be taken into account when the teacher is thinking about instructional decisions concerning that student or group of students. So once again, that instructional piece is always interwoven throughout everything that they're going to do. And so that's important that it's a part of your instruction for them so that they are prepared adequately.
this web this link here takes you directly to the study material and from students who have taken the exam previously they indicate that the study materials are really helpful to give them a sense of what type of questions are on there how the questions are worded so I off I always recommend that students review those study materials and become more familiar with the layout and the design of the exam because it does seem to help them so we're going to begin to wrap it up here and just sort of summarize what we've been doing and kind of leave you with some um, next steps if you would so when you think about all of this information as it relates to diversity education you may ask yourself what role would you play how do you play the role of being an equity oriented change agent or someone who is focused on raising awareness about um, all populations or different populations of students and people and the first is to have an equity attitude and that means that you want to model what you want others to learn and do and this is a continual journey for all of us we are all on a journey and learning is such a continuous process we never stop but it's important that we realize that having an attitude of equity really shines through in how we handle our own business and how we treat students and how we encourage them to treat their future students as well we want to avoid avoid demonizations and that means characterizing someone wholly by one negative characteristic or characterizing someone else as totally negative no one is totally negative no situation is totally bad there are um, variations throughout every situation it will encounter and so we want to encourage um, our candidates as well as ourselves to avoid those those types of demonizations because they are very harmful that's the root of stereotypes and discriminatory practices and we really want to avoid that we want to look for opportunities to initiate courageous conversations and that engages those who won't talk um, sustains conversation when it gets uncomfortable or diverted and deepens the conversation to the point where authentic understanding and meaningful actions occur this is critical for our teacher education programs we want to initiate those types of conversations at the instructional level at colleges are you talking to your faculty about that are you understanding how students of color uh, uh, students from underrepresented groups are being represented or maybe not represented at your college are they really feel, are you really providing instructional opportunities for them to thrive based on their cultural experiences and are you bringing that into into the picture and so this is not just something that you want to turn key to your candidates but I even encourage you as faculty to think about it as well it really is very important demonstrate persistence recognize that inequalities are often deeply embedded in daily practices and reflect the status quo people are used to and depend on them there's a certain way that people do things and you ask why they're doing it that way and they'll say that's just how we've always done it and that's not always the best answer so demonstrate persistence and moving toward effective change is really a critical thing for all of us remains committed but patient you have to be in it for the long haul and it requires patience and so when we're thinking about about being equity oriented and a change agent being one that is diversity conscious of, of, of various environments and having awareness and skill sets we want to make sure that we are consistent with that process it's not a one-time workshop it's not a one-time thing but it's something that goes on continuously because it's always about growing and getting better maintains an asset attitude value people and what they bring to the process everyone brings something everyone has something to contribute to the larger arena and we want to keep that in mind um, the last is maintains a coherent focus keep in, keep reminding yourself what your focus is and keep communicating that focus I have found that over a number of years I have definitely committed myself to raising awareness about diversity I've had to challenge my own self and my own interaction with my students and I've questioned whether or not I'm really being a equity oriented change agent because that's part of the reflective cycle we ask questions and we seek to find out if we're really doing what we need to do in an effective way and so I'm always asking questions and always trying to get better and encouraging my candidates to do the same and so I would do the same for you I would encourage you to look at these items and have discussions amongst yourselves so it's not just about the test it's about being better so here are some suggestions that I want to leave you with. Um, if you don't already have one, create a course that specifically addresses the targeted areas that are on the exam. It's great to do that 
not just for the exam, but just because it's good stuff. It's good stuff. It's good information. Um, if you can't create a course, create like a non-credit required type of course, like a workshop, and make it a full day. Um, have someone come in to facilitate or find someone on your campus that can do that. And go over some of these topics and as I presented here you have some things to kind of get you started um, some ideas to kind of get you moving in that direction and I'm certainly willing to help anyone who needs some assistance in that area um, identify places across your program where these key concepts are discussed and can be internalized and assessed um, definitely look for where you are addressing and raising awareness of these particular domains of diverse student populations and I say internalize and ask and assess because just because you talk about it once or twice doesn't it mean it's, it's really internalized how, how do you know that students are really walking away with an understanding um, do you yourself have a deep understanding to be able to assess them appropriately just something to think about and finally create some opportunities for faculty to discuss these key topics so that they are equipped to do so with their candidates I think that's critical um, so often if we you know in, in higher education we teach what we're most comfortable with because that's how college works right but I think that because we are working with people and working in a profession that's ever changing it's so important that we are um, keeping ourselves abreast to some of those changes and how we can get better address our own shortcomings so that we can continue to grow and be effective so I want to just say in wrapping up that the EAS exam is more than just a test we're talking about children we're talking about people people from different backgrounds different races and cultures and experiences that are not all served equally by the larger population and so while it is an exam that assesses a candidate's understanding of some of those key concepts we don't want it to ever just stay at the testing level we want it to be something that is completely uh, internalized and transferred into what they do in the classroom on a daily basis we're talking about equity. We're talking about providing what students need, providing a piece to the puzzle that's going to help a student be successful in their educational pursuit. So while the test will ask questions about whether or not they know terms such as educational equity, we want that notion to be so much a part of what we do as teacher educators that it is evidenced not only on passing an exam, but on writing meaningful lesson plans and ultimately teaching groups of students in a ways that that are very effective and finally it's really about best practice this is an opportunity for our candidates to show off um, it should not be something that's begrudgingly looked at as just or oh, another thing just to sort of put a tick mark that you've completed but I think that this assessment really pushes us to think about what we do how we do it and how we can do it better to educate all students in a way that is effective for them meaningful for their needs is best practice when we do that we're really doing our job so I want to just say thank you I hope that this time has been meaningful for you I hope that you've learned a few things and I hope that it has really piqued your interest and your understanding of the topic and even provided you with some ideas of how you can move forward that's really what it's all about uh, and I just want to just say thanks once again for listening my name is Tiffany Powell and I am I am an assistant professor at the Sage Colleges and it has been a pleasure to speak with you today take care